I want you to get, Lou, is, is talking about the, uh, the way things were back then. You know, on the tape we saw earlier, there was a comment about we never thought about playing in the majors. There was no, no big deal with that. And you can't shoot that while I'm, when, when he's talking. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense because we're all. Just kind of cover that. Yeah. Come on, give me the word. Just, just in a second. Whenever you're ready. Well, I never thought much of uh, the white ball players because I have known quite a few of them, and quite a few of them were friends of mine from the area where I was living. I never had an idea of playing in the major leagues at that time, but then after this uh, race issue came up, the trouble was uh, you couldn't have blamed the white boys because they would have lost quite a few jobs. At that time, there was only 16 ball clubs, and if you'd have put all the Negro, we had 16 ball clubs, and if you had taken two off each ball club, look how many jobs, there have been 32 jobs that the white boys would not have had because it was a definite source that the Negro ball players, some of the Negro ball players were far superior to the whites that were playing at that time. And another issue was the owners. The owners found out that uh, we rented their ballparks. And when they were out of town, we used all major league ballparks with the exception of the Cubs. And we drew tremendous crowds. Therefore, they would have lost that revenue too. And that the economical reasoning was quite the issue too. Not only the ball players, but the owners, they would have lost that money. Consequently, they weren't too anxious about uh, having the ball clubs integrated. Why should they when they was getting money both ways? Just cover that for me. Well, as a kid, uh, I used to always hang around the ballparks. In fact, I was going to Polytechnic High School. It was uh, oh, a block away from the Pacific Coast League ballpark, and I used to pass by there on my way home, and the foul balls would come over, and I saw the guys all running for the foul balls, and I said, well, what are they doing? They said, they're getting in the ballpark. <laughs> so one day I ditched my last class, and I came by, and I picked up a ball, and I went in. They had a groundkeeper there named Ed. And he would give you a little pass, and with this pass you could get in the ball game the next day, and then you could sweep, and you could get another pass. So consequently, there was very few Pacific Coast ball games that uh, I didn't see. And I can remember one time when the Los Angeles had their ball club, and they had all major leaguers, ex-major leaguers at that time, and that ball club in those days were far superior than the ball clubs that, uh, that are playing now in the major leagues because they had maybe one or two minor league aspirants on the ball club, but the rest of them were major leaguers. And I saw all those big timers who came, like Johnny Bassler, he was one of them, Rube Ellis, all those fellas, and Bill Perker, they had all been in the big leagues, Sam Crawford, and they were no names. And then I said, uh, I think I'd like to play ball. And the guys would go around on Saturdays. We'd have go from one part of town to the other, and we had little pickup teams. And I'd just go around and play. And I used to bat cross-handed when I was a kid. And when I got to high school, I could hit the ball doggone a long ways cross-handed. So the coach told me, he says, or, uh, turn over, and he said, and, uh, try hitting on the left side, and I turned on the left side, and that seemed more natural than it did the right side. So about, oh, maybe six or seven, eight months, I learned how to hit on my right side, hit correctly. And that's how I started uh, hitting from both sides. Then in the winter, they had a club that came out here. They were all Negro major leaguers, and they used to play all on Fourth and Anderson, and then consequently they built a new park over on the east side, right back at Jefferson High School. And I used to go over there and watch those guys, and I'd go out there with my little glove, and the guy would chase me off. And one day, they went had a pickup team over there. And I played with one of the pickup team, played against the uh, Negro club because they were just practicing. 
and I was tearing those pictures up. And the guy said, well, give that little young guy a suit and let him play, because the rest of the fellows hadn't came out. And I played the first game that was ever played in the White Sox ballpark. I played right field because McNair, Kansas City Monarchs, he hadn't arrived. And that's how I started playing. Well, the next year, they let me play. And the only reason that uh, I didn't like it because I found out that the manager of the club, from the cut that they were getting, the guys were making 60 or 70 dollars, sometime more than that on Saturday and on Sunday they were making close to 100 dollars every week, and the guy was only giving me a quarter, a fourth of a cut, and so Newt Allen says, "How much she give you? How much did Lonnie give you?" I said, "25 dollars," and that's the reason I was disillusioned with uh, playing for those fellows. I found out how they did. My daddy told me the same thing. He said, if you go back east, he said, they were going to do you the same way. But nevertheless, I left in August. Rogan uh, recommended me to the American Giants, and I left in August of 1925, and I went to Chicago. Well, I got there on a Saturday evening, and I went over to Bingo to Master's house. The next day, I went to the ballpark with him. We walked from 40s and uh, Indiana over to 39th and Wentworth. And when we got over to Wentworth, I saw that line of people, and I looked up Bingo, and he laughed. I said, what's the, ma what's the matter? I said, well, what are these people here for? He said, they're waiting to get in the ballpark. So when I went to, went in the ballpark, they gave me a uniform, and when I came outside, I saw more Negroes than I'd ever seen in my life. And the Kansas City Monarchs were playing that day. I never will forget it, and I went into the Kansas City Clubhouse, and all the guys there, practically all of them, I knew. And they said, well, you finally made it. I said, well, I'm here, and I said, thanks very much for you fellows helping me get here. And Kansas City beat the American Giants uh, 18 to nothing. I never will forget it, and Rogan was pitching. And that was the thrill of my life, me at standing out there, and I played right field, and Jelly Gardner and Cristobal Toretti, who was in the Hall of Fame, that was the outfield. And later on, they said that that was the fastest outfield and the best outfield that the Negroes have ever had, the three of us together, combined. Okay, Lou, you were with the American Giants and the, uh, the owner, the manager, was Rube Foster who was really the, the founder of baseball and the, the, the Negro National League. Mm -hmm. um, I guess he was, was perhaps the most respected name uh, in, in the business from your end, wasn't he? And yes. How was it to, to, to play for a man like this and be with him? Well, Rube Foster, I played for him very briefly because that was August and the next year Rube didn't come back. Rube, uh, he had a uh, stroke, and he never did come back. But the time that I played for him, he was very strict, and he had his ways, and all the ball players knew who Rube Foster was. And he was respected all over the league because he was the founder of the league. Not only did he find was the founder of the league, he set up clubs in other towns, and he secured the ball players and secured owners to make the league as much like the white leagues, professional baseball, as it was. And we had leagues, eight clubs was in the western, and there were six out east. And those clubs prospered very well, the western ball club. The eastern was a different situation because the eastern ball clubs, they were all close around one another, and they had automobiles that they uh, traveled in from one town to the other. We traveled on trains, we had Pullmans half the time. I hear some people say, but when I first went in baseball, the first salary I ever received was $250 a month, and that was in 1925. And at that time, we were getting $2 and a half a day. And I heard Crutchfield and some of the other fellows say when they came in, they was getting a dollar and a quarter a day and all like that. I guess it was with the ball clubs that you played with, uh, who determined how much you would get. Because even over in Detroit with Bingo to Moss, and that was bad, bad times, we still had $2 a day. That's where you always stay with DeMoss.
because he always looked out for his ball players and he saw that the owners, he saw that we, you know, received our good You're talking about meal money. Hmm? You're talking about this money for your meals, two dollars yes. a day, plus your two fifty a month. Yes. Let's let's just let you go on the topic of of the two fifty a month you were getting in that time period, and that was pretty good money back then for yes. a black man or for a white man. That's true. And during the thirties, you were lucky to have a job anywhere. That's quite true. Let's let's cover that that aspect. Okay, <clears throat> the two fifty that I received per month was for my salary. And the salary started in May the 15th and the 5th to the 15th of September, which was not too long, but then you had the options of playing baseball in the winter, wherever you wished to go. I, most of the times I went, to, I went to California because that was my home. And the next season when you came back, you started. And then after the season, we paid a whole lot of exhibition ball came we, with uh, different major league ball clubs, such as Coney Mack, his All-Stars, and then uh, Later on, I played against Bob Feller with his All-Stars. And getting back to the eating money, we received away from home, when I was with Chicago, we received $2.50 a day. And back out in Hilldale, out east, it was $2 a day. That was in the 30s. And 36, I came back to Chicago, we jumped back up to two and a half a day. And we spring, we went to spring training in New Orleans. There's no way in the world for you to eat up two and a half a day because you breakfast, thirty-five cents, and you could eat all you want in the evenings for, oh, if you spent seventy-five cents, you was a big spender at that time. So consequently, you were making money on your eating money. And I hear some of the fellows talking about on the other ball clubs that uh, the little amount of money they receive. Even uh, Buck Leonard was talking about. The salary hundred and a quarter. I never heard of a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month on clubs that I played on, but out west they paid more. But out east the salary the in thirty-three when Gus had the All-Star Bowl, All-Star team in Cleveland. Even at that time, we received two dollars a day when the other fellows on the club and those guys were getting a dollar seventy-five cents. So it depended on who you played for. And the owner and the manager who you played for is how much money that you receive for your food, so on and so forth. Okay, that's good. I'll give you the signal. The $250 at that time was top priority as far as uh, money was concerned because a Negro at that time, there was no money to be made. In fact, there was hardly any job that you would get besides janitor jobs and uh, something of that sort. There was not too many professional Negro men at that time. And baseball player was a high-class player. Everybody, the same as it is today, everyone wanted an athlete and uh, you had practically the top, you were the top man. And Rube Foster, this time, as an owner and a manager, of a league, he was almost as big, as big as the president. In fact, in the Negro world, he was a big, big man. And he was rated up there with the bankers and everybody, everybody else. And everyone would want you to come around their place and uh, sign autographs, so on and so forth. Not as much as now because uh, we didn't have baseball cards and those things. But you would sign their scorecards and certain elements like that. And some little kids would come up and They'd ask you for this and that, and uh, people was always asking you, oh, you're a big man, let me have a dollar here, a dollar there, and you give them 50 cents, and they were tickling it in. And so that, I guess it's the same as today, is with the all athletes, people run after you. And I had that, uh, that uh, pleasure, because I always liked people, and I, I'm the same way today. Good, that for me, when I give you the signal. Oh, quite a few of the ball players at that time, uh, they were known to be, especially the ones who had gone to college. We had quite a few of the ball players who went to the Negro colleges. And those, the ones in the Negro college. Wait, look, Grant, the, the phones that have come through. Okay, Lou, same topic. Whenever I give you the cue. 
Yeah, quite a few of the ball players uh, who had who were at that time going to college, they would go to college, uh, the Negro schools, and then they played ball in the summertime. Uh, I had a friend of mine who went to Meharry College and in Detroit, a Dr. Orange, he became a doctor. At that time he was going to Meharry and there was two or three of them that became lawyers and they married, most of them, George Sweat, he married a school teacher. In fact, he was a school teacher himself and quite a few of those fellows taught school. So consequently, uh, they married pretty good. Those who wanted to get married at that time, because I came home, I left, I didn't play in 1926. Uh, I came back home and I married, and I married a school teacher's daughter. So <laughs> everybody at that time, being an athlete and a college person, you had your choice uh, as far as uh, society was concerned. And a lot of the ball players uh, that didn't have too much of an education, consequently, they were in their class. They didn't uh, marry into the top economic, but uh, those who wished had their choice. And so it was more or less like society like it is today. The all, every segment segregates itself, no matter who it is. <coughs> I remember one incident out at Hilldale. We were playing, uh, I think we were playing Baltimore at the time. And in the ninth inning, at, in the ninth inning, but prior to that, the ballpark was out in Derby, Pennsylvania. And that was a little town outside of uh, Philadelphia. And the taxis, they would line up out there and they would bring the patrons to the ballpark and these taxi cabs. Uh, so, at the ninth inning, we had two men on base and one out, and the score tied, and uh, the taxi cab drivers was hollering, taxi, taxi, we're all leaving, we're all leaving. At that time, I hit a double, and the game was over with. <laughs> another time, uh, there was another fella up, and he was saying the same thing, and uh, the guy popped up, and the guy said, my mistake, Dials wasn't up to bat. <laughs> so that's the fun we used to have around Philadelphia there when I was playing for Judy Johnson when Judy was manager of the Hilldale Ball Club. Talk some about the, uh, the crowd, Jack. I know you're, first of all, you guys didn't play in little small parks. You played in big league stadiums when the yeah, teams were away. Yeah, there's a couple of, I'll tell them about the, few Negro parks that were available at that time, but the rest of the time we played in larger ballparks. Okay. Go in. Just tell me about the playing, playing in a Yankee Stadium and places like that and the crowds you drew. Okay. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready when you're ready. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> at the, uh, we played most of our games, we had a ballpark in, uh, Chicago, the American Giants ballpark, was the old White Sox ballpark. It was all oh, about, the White Sox ballpark was on 35th, and I was on 39th Street, right exactly north of the park. And our park seated maybe around about, oh, about 9,000. But the first day I played in there, they had 18,000 people all around, and they had to rope it off. Most of the time at the other places where they didn't have the parks, we played in a major league park like Crosley Field and the Yankee Stadium. Of course, when we went into the Yankee Stadium, we would play uh, a doubleheader. So there'd be four Negro ball clubs there. And you drew anywhere from 45 to 50 some odd thousand people. Played in the polo grounds, played in Griff Stadium and all those places. And in Baltimore, Baltimore had their own ballpark Nashville had their own ballpark, but a lot, a lot of times you played at Sulfordale, that was the double-A ballpark. Birmingham didn't have a ballpark, so you played in the Black Barons ballpark. And uh, let's see, there's in Kansas City, they had no ballpark, so you played in Mubach Field. All the clubs, and they drew tremendous crowds because they had white, but there was no, at that time, in the, when we played, they weren't segregated, only in Birmingham. 
in Birmingham, they still segregated the people, and you played, you didn't play on Sundays. You played on a Monday there because we would play in Chicago, and then we'd take a Pullman out of there. We'd go to Birmingham, and you'd get there the next afternoon. We'd change our, on the train. We changed on the train and rode to the ballpark, and we played uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then we came on back, and probably on the way back, we'd stop and play some other little minor league ball club from there on into Memphis. And there's another thing that uh, was quite an interesting. Money wasn't too hard. In fact, the fares, at least, on trains. And uh, in Chicago, they would have clubs from the south. They would run an excur excursion out of there. And those people would bring us, say, four and 5,000 people up from those smaller towns, uh, say, Memphis, Birmingham, Kansas, those kind of places. And we had tremendous crowds, even in our own ballpark. But I played at Crosby Field at times there, and it was almost packed. It was a small ballpark, almost packed. And at Griff Stadium, at one time, we packed the ballpark. That was in 1932 when the East-West opened up. Hilldale played Washington, and Vice President Curtis threw the first ball out. We had over 15,000 people at that time. Drink. Okay, thanks. You got some bourbon out there. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> okay, Lou, East West All Star Game was a really important thing. Mm. Drew huge crowds as a showcase. If you can cover something about that, that'd be good whenever you're ready. The first East West Game was promoted by. The Negro League, the, a lot of people say that uh, someone else was originated. The originator of the East-West game was Abe Sapperstein. Abe Sapperstein sold the idea to the Negro League, and he secured the White Sox ballpark for this All-Star game. And for that, he received 5% of, I think it was 46,000 people. So a lot of people say that I've read in some books where somebody from Gus Greenlee's was originated, but that's not true because I used to ride with Abe. Abe, uh, when we would go up to Madison, Wisconsin, I would ride up there with him in his little old Ford. And he was telling me prior to that what he was trying to do, so therefore I know the history of it. Again. And that was the, at that time, after the American League played, I saw that game, the American League and the National League All-Star game, which the uh, American League won four to two. In fact, I rode out to the game in the car with Geringer, Dickey, and Mohart. Those are the fellows uh, that I rode out from the Windermere Hotel out to the ballpark with. And Lazari, he was a buddy of mine. And that game, that's time when uh, Babe Ruth, I suppose, had said, they asked him, interviewed him, and asked him uh, what he was going to do today. And he told them that no man has a bad day on a big day. But that quote was by Grant Wright, his ghostwriter. And, but our game turned out to be almost just as bad. I was playing on the West, and the East team, who Gus Greenlee had, he wanted us to be on the East team. So DeMoss and I came in, and we were on the West Ball Club. And then we transferred us over to the East. We, the East won. Let's, let's break it. Let's, we got <laughs> Okay, Lou, East-West All-Star game. Well, I think uh, the, East, the first East-West All-Star game uh, ended up in a score of 11 to... Hey, wait a second. Okay. 11 to 8. Okay, let's, eight. Let's, let's just talk about the All-Star Game concept in general, that it was the, how important it was and the crowds it drew. Yeah. Okay? Well, the, <clears throat> one reason the, the crowds, we had so many at these different ballparks, I think that's the reason that uh, it led to the demise of the Negro League, because we were drawing, say, for an average of... Uh, 45, 
25,000 people in every one of these ballparks that we play that. And so consequently, I think these owners got something in their head that, uh, that if they had Negroes in the league playing on that ball club, that they could draw those people that uh, we were drawing at the ballpark. And then on the other hand, some of them did not want it because it would have uh, cut into their revenue of what they were drawing from the ballpark. But the first, right after the first All-Star game that we had in 33, we went right over to Cleveland the very next Sunday and played over there. And we had a tremendous crowd over there because Satchel came back from out of Bismarck and he pitched over there. And we had a tremendous crowd. That was two Sundays in a row that we had probably 75,000 people. Just two Sundays in a row. That was at the new uh, Cleveland Stadium. Prior to that time, we had played at Dunn's Field, and I think uh, maybe that was the first, I can't recall for sure, but it was real early. Maybe that was the first year that they had uh, baseball in Cleveland Stadium. I don't recall for sure, but it may have been the first year that they had baseball at that uh, Cleveland Stadium. What sort of con contracts you had? Huh? Contracts. We talked about the uh, contracts and lack of contracts. The light? You know, the, the, the lack of contracts. You know, like you, you signed All a contract, the, but it was yeah. only for, for a brief period. Yeah, but for uh, six, uh, four months. That's all we had. The baseball contract in our league was for four months, from uh, May the 15th and until uh, September the 15th. After that, you were on percentage. But at $250 a month at that time, that was real, real, real money. Because I remember I could buy a pair of shoes for eight, uh, floor shine shoes for $8.95. I remember the first pair of floor shine I ever bought was in 1925. I wasn't able to buy those kind of shoes because at that, uh, and tennis shoes, we used to wear tennis shoes around home in the summertime, and they cost a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> so making that kind of money, why, it was a tremendous thing for me. I. Uh, in fact, when I went home that winter, I had bought me a trunk and I had it full of clothes. And you, the, didn't, you didn't just play baseball. Mm -hmm. You didn't play baseball just four months. You played pretty much year round for what? 20 yeah, years? I play, yeah, I played. I played. So your, your summer just kept going on. Going on, and we played. Oh, and our summer. You're speaking of ball games. The fellows who play now, they play one game, and then when they play the doubleheader then the next day they don't play. But a typical weekend, take for instance today, we played Saturday afternoon, we played Patterson, New Jersey. Then we'd leave there, we'd go down eastern Pennsylvania, cross over to Phillipsburg. We played that night. Then we came back to New York, we'd play a doubleheader in the afternoon, some of those clubs around there, and then a night game. Now we did all this, we had five pitchers. But when we played them those small clubs, uh, some of the infields, I pitched many a game against some of those small clubs, and that's the way we got by. Pitchers never had so on because they pitched every day. They pitched a day and pitched batting practice. And a lot of time when we would be, <laughs> I remember the pitchers, when we were going to be playing a big game in the Negro League, you'd see all the pitchers running out to the uh, Want to pitch batting practice because they didn't want to pitch against a certain ball club. <laughs> but you don't find uh, find the fellows doing that uh, today. But the most of the times we would play two games every day, every day. That was we play a twilight game and a night game. The only time we didn't play two ball games a day was it rained. That was the only reason that you didn't play. I played. Actually, in the Negro League, our home season, we played those four months, let's see, four, four, but we played at least from 200 to 250 games a, a season. That was a short season when you just played that many games, because if you had, didn't have a rainy season, you played every day, and just as a... Uh, they said we, uh, a lot of time, we slept in our uniforms, especially on Sundays. When you'd leave Sunday afternoon, you'd play a doublehead, and then you'd go right on over to 
somewhere around New York or wherever you were playing, and you kept that uniform on. You played that night. And then you got back in New York, and you was ready to go the next day for a doubleheader. So there was no let up in our play. And at that time, I remember when, when the major leaguers came to Mexico, why Pascal, uh, he secured some ball players. And them guys, Max Lanier and Ernie White, and I'll think of the second baseman's name. He just laid on pass, and he was one of the, uh, he was when the Cubs had those eight managers at one time. He was one of the managers on that in that in that group. Well, them guys wasn't making but forty five hundred dollars a season, and Pasco gave them seventeen. That's the reason I know they wasn't making any money. Four and five thousand dollars a year. That was back in the uh, back in the forties. So baseball had gone down. And let's go on to the. Uh, I know you played year round for mm -hmm. a long time. Kind of give me a summary of. Your Negro League schedule was over, and you'd go to either California or Mexico or yeah. the Caribbean or South America or whatever. This gave me kind of a, a, a general summation of a typical year where you play in April through September, and then what happens where you play in, for, to have a year-round season. Okay. The stick pension in 27, well, I was play, starting the beginning of the year, I was playing out in, in Los Angeles, playing with the L.A. White Sox, and then we played clean through spring training because we played the Major League, uh, Pacific Coast League Cup. We played Seattle and Portland. We played Seattle in Bakersfield, California. We played Portland and San Jose. Then we came east, and it was time enough. I think we had two weeks break, and then the Negro League opened up. And then we played all through that, and then I went back out to California in the winter, so I played the year round. Very few days I had off. Maybe I had maybe a month off. I played 11 months in that year, and most all of it was the same thing every year. And the only reason is one one season that uh, 1930, 1935. I was getting ready to go to uh, Cuba. And there was a guy who came out to the Democratic Club. That's where all the ball players would hang out. And this guy wanted some waiters <laughs> to work on the train from uh, New York to Miami. So at that time, they weren't paying over in Cuba. They weren't paying but $60 a week. And the guy, was, I said, what kind of money do you make as a waiter? He said, oh, you make good money, good tips. So I wanted a trip to Miami anyhow. <laughs> so I, I worked that winter uh, as a waiter. So when I, the, the next morning I went down and I told the guy, <laughs> Stuart, I said, I don't know anything about waiting tape. He said, but you sure got a lease? No. What do you do? I told him I was a ball player. I was in then, but I told him I was a ball player. <laughs> So the, all the waiters, they laughed and they showed me how to put things on my tray and how to wait table. And I waited table that minute. And I, I made more money that winter waiting table than I would have in Cuba. So that was only one winter in 35 that I didn't, uh, but I don't regret it. I had a lot of fun going up and down. I, and so happened I, I saw uh, Greenberg on the train coming back. and. He was in, came to diner one day. He said, what in the H are you doing here? I said, well, you see what I'm doing? He said, I thought you were in Cuba. I said, no, I'm having a lot of fun down here. And that, that was one ball player that I saw that knew that I waited table. That was Hank Greenberg, who passed uh, just a week or so out in California. Yeah. That's good. Well, during the, I guess, starting maybe in, after the war in, in the in the 30s, but in the 40s also, there were lots of exhibition games. After the season was over, major league players would barnstorm play against some of the black players. We did that way back in 27. Okay, let's talk about that because I don't know what happened. Yeah. And uh, that was your chance to really know how good you were. Yeah, that was way back in tw in 27. I played against. Uh... Okay, start off with with the concept of of the Negro League guys, when the season was over, would play against the major leaguers in the White yeah. League. 
But this would be kind of embarrassing to the white boys. We That's beat, all right. Let's just talk about it. We beat them guys 13 out of 15. Let's start again talking about this. this set, set, do me a setup for it. Give me the setting. Oh. Uh, after the seasons were over, you would play against the white teams. After the season was over uh, uh, in 1927, we played uh, Corny Mac's All-Stars. And Corny Mac at that time, he had Bing Miller was in right field. They had uh, Chapman in center. And one of the pitchers would play left field. They had uh, Pinky Higgins, third base, Red Chris, Charlie Geringer, and Art Shires. They had Benny Bingo from the Yankees was catching. They had Ted Lyons, Al Thomas of the White Sox, Earl Whitehill of Detroit, Yule of uh, Cleveland, and Emke of the Athletics, and we played them in Chicago and all the around the cities around, like up in Wisconsin and Minneapolis and around Illinois. There, we played them a series of 15 ball games, and we won 13 out of the 50. Now that was show you the strength of the Negro All Star Ball Club. We had Wells and all that bunch. We had an all-star club, and it was pretty hard to to beat those, for those fellows to beat us. Of course, Whitehill and Yule, both of them beat, shut us out at one time, but we had beaten them also. And then the last year that I played against uh, was 1946. Jack Robson was on the ball club. We used him as a drawing card because he had been to, uh, been signed and organized baseball. That was Chet Brewer's club in California, known as the Royals. Good starting point right there, almost the end of the tape. Everybody remembers Josh Gibson and Satchel Page because yeah. they were the most publicized, just yeah. like the Yankees got all the, New York gets all the publicity. Yeah. But the best players were somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, we're speaking of players who have never, who have, uh, probably you have never heard of. We had players in the Negro League. Now, Josh and Satchel were publicized more than any other players. And with the exception, Cool Papa Bell, but Cool could do something. Cool was, he is one person who lived up to his name. Now, Josh, we had the, Josh was a powerful hitter, a home run hitter. But we had two or three other catchers who were more famous than he. Now, Mackey, without a doubt, he and Pitway were the best catchers we had in our league. There was another catcher named Pythian Russ. Russ died early, and you couldn't... He died early, but you couldn't... Uh, ball players. Some of the more famous ball players. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> as I said before, uh, the good catchers, we were speaking of uh, the good catchers. The people that you know now, like Roy Campanella, Campanella was not a great catcher in the Negro League because he was young at that time and he was just starting. But he is not rated as the top catchers in the Negro League. He's, he matured after, he and Jack Robinson both, they matured after they left the Negro League. Bingo de Moss, of course, everybody knows of him, but we had other great second basemen, Sammy T. Hughes and George Scales. They were great, great ball players, but nobody ever says anything about them, only among the old Negro ball players. But when they start to publicize, I've, that's the reason I criticize more of these other books and things that have came out, because they speak of just a few segment of them. They haven't researched enough to know, at least they don't want to put it in there. Just like uh, when they had the first voting for uh, the Hall of Fame. The commissioner at that time, he only wanted people who was in the major league and who they knew. Therefore, they eliminated our segment of them. Our segment should have been 
for ourselves and let the people who were on that committee judge who should have been in there first. It would have been a different structure had it not been for the commissioner, the ex-commissioner of baseball, because Mackey and those fellows would have been there instead of satchel them in the first. That is one thing that I criticize for so many of our great ball players not being known of. Mule Settles. He could hit the ball as far as anybody. Turkey Stern. In fact, Turkey Stern hit more home runs in the Negro League than Josh Gibson did. But Josh Gibson was uh, publicized because uh, he hit all those home runs playing out east, and most of them were hit uh, against the little minor league clubs and uh, semi-pro clubs. Of course, Turkey did the same thing, but the publicity is where it gets you where you are. But now there's Smith now, the top shortstop in professional baseball. We had five fellows who could play just as equally as well as he. There was Lundy. Lundy was more of his type, that flashy type. Lundy would have been a better hitter in the big leagues and covered the same amount of ground. And there was no way in the world for Smith to hit as much as Moore or Lundy or uh, uh, Pop Lloyd. No way in the world that he could have hit at, the, at those fellows. And then getting back to you, uh, there was another fellow that the people don't say anything about, with Dewey Creasy and Wells, that uh, St. Louis Star team. Both of those were excellent ball players, real excellent ball players. And the best hitter for one year in the Negro League was Walter Davis. They called him Steel Arm played in 1927. You couldn't get him out. Hardly. That guy hit over 600. No way in the world could you get him out. See, nobody says anything about those fellows. And down in Birmingham, they had players down there. Especially one of them was named Red Parnell. Great, great outfielder. You never hear anything about them. The fellows write books, all kind of books. Nobody says anything about Parnell. He had to be rich that were good players, but not so yeah. well known. And uh, Rube Curry, Rube Curry, uh, a pitcher. These people who, uh, for some reason, they have overlooked. Nobody ever says anything about him. Rube Curry was one of your top curveball pitchers in the Negro League. Another one they haven't said it. They talk about him, but they talk about him in kind of a bad term. Was Chet Brewer? Chet Brewer was a great, great pitcher. But uh, on the other hand, Chet had a uh, bad habit of cutting the ball. And that's the reason you don't hear it to him. But without cutting the ball, Chet uh, actually was a better pitcher than Satchel. But every time that uh, you saw Chet, you would think of him that he was cutting the ball. He and Smokey Joe pitched a, together. They struck out 40 some odd men in a ball game played in Kansas City, which the uh, Homestead Graves won one to nothing. 19 innings, both of them pitched, and they struck out 40 some odd men. They knew the ball was cut because they cut the ball <laughs> prior to the game. And that was the, that's how great Chet was a master of it. He could make the ball, he could cut it so it'd go up, down, in, or out. Most of the pitchers today, it only is one way, it's up or down. And well, you, spent, you spent uh, 20 years playing baseball and saw some of the best black and white. You spent yeah. a lot of years scouting after that four major league teams. Oh, teams yes. Uh, what I want you to talk about, best player you ever saw? Scouting? No, best player you ever saw. Oh, the best player I ever saw, without a doubt, was Martin Diego. Martin Diego could do everything. Uh, he... The first time I saw uh, Diego, he was playing outfield. He was playing with uh, playing right field for Hilldale. And he had one of the best arms in baseball. The next time Martin Diego, he was pitching. He won 20 some odd games any time that he got ready to pitch in the Negro League. If he needs a second baseman, he could play it. I've seen him play everywhere. I've seen him play every position but catch. And he was on a club over in Cuba with Johnny Mize. Johnny Mize was the American batting league champion. 
And they used to walk Diego to get at Johnny Mize. That was over, that was over in Cuba. Another time, uh, the the in and out, not the in and out, but Louisville had won the American Association uh, title, and they took that whole club over there in the winter. And it's for spring training. They were going over there to show those guys how to play. So they played the Cubans, and the Cubans won two straight games. Of course, Lukey pitched one day, and uh, somebody else, some other guy pitched. Well, Lukey was a major league pitcher, so naturally he was going to win. So they said, the American uh, National Association said, well, they don't have nobody to pitch tomorrow. I said, uh, we'll beat them. And Diego shut them out. And he would have been a 20-game winner in any place. And he could have won as many games. We had Bill Foster in the Negro League. There's just too many. Uh, and Bill Holland. See, nobody says anything about those, those pitchers. And I see time and time again, books and books, nobody's ever even said of them. And George, uh, down there was another name, um, George Mitchell with St. Louis. Trent. Nobody says anything about those. All those fellas could, the, that I'm speaking of now were major league ball players and would have been stars in the ma major league. And uh, there was another outfielder uh, that was at, in Memphis, Pinky Ward, a left-hander, and could hit left-hand pitching as good as he could right-hand. An outstanding ball player. I have never saw a book or a word said about him. And he was one of the out outstanding men. Well, going way back, there was plenty of the fellows that could play, but those are just the top. I've just reached off the top of the fellows who were great, great ball players. Yeah. Okay. Close to Jackie Robinson was the first, but boy, you were almost. Uh, I had an incident. Uh, it was 1938 when um, I came back, and we were playing. I went to the ballpark because the Mexican League was going to bring their club over, and I went up to the ballpark and uh, asked Roland about playing in the ballpark and talked to the fellows around there, and he said, yeah. He said, you can have the ballpark for... At that time, he was a general manager of the Los Angeles Angels, and that they were a parent club of the Cubs. And he said, yeah, you fellows can uh, play in the park. So we paid them 10%, and we played the Mexican League All-Stars. And I had such a terrific year that year, and we played all winter. And the, the games that we played out there, all those fellas saw me play. The uh, manager of the club was Bill Sweeney, and uh, another fellow was named Hughes, the second baseman. I had known Hughes for some time. But the thrill that I got out of that game, at least my father, it was in the ninth <laughs> inning of one game, and the score was tied 2-2. And I hit a towering home run up in the right field bleachers. My daddy jumped up and said, that's my son. That's my son. The same one that didn't want me to play ball. So they said, sit down, Mr. Dow. Sit down. Everybody told my dad to sit, sit down. So I went up and I talked to Roland and I said, uh, hey, I said, I'd like to play. Uh, how about playing next year? And he said, we were going to ask you about going to spring training. And Sweeney said, yeah. I said, I suggested that we get you to take care of spring training. He said, you want to go? I said, Jesus, yeah, I want to go. So I told him, I said, I'd like to bring Brewer with me, too. He said, OK, you'll have a roommate with you. And uh, Hugh said, no, I'll be his roommate. <laughs> so about two weeks prior to that time, in 39, two weeks prior, I just went around the office because I lived not too far from the ballpark. I went over there and was sitting down talking. And at that time, he told me that uh, there was no availability for me to play. And I asked him why. He said, because uh, Wrigley 
said, no matter how good you are, he said, there's no place for you in organized baseball in the major league. So why utilize a space on the roster with somebody who could never do the big club any good? But he says, I'll tell you there's one man, he says, that wants a ball player, and I told him about you, and he says, when Oakland comes down to play, you tell uh, the manager to give you a uniform. And at that time, it was Johnny Burgess who formerly played with uh, the New York Giants. He was a third baseman. He came down, and I told him uh, what Devin Suskid said. And he said, well, I don't believe it. So we said, call him. So we paid for the call. We had sport writers from the Negro press was out there to see us. That was on a Thursday because they were supposed to open up season on a Friday. And he called up and he come out sweating. He said, before I'll sign you, he said, I'll let you play, I'll quit baseball. He said, they would crucify me, which was true. I later found out it was true. That Sunday, we picket the ballpark with the sport riders and some of the ball players, and we had signs up, and a lot of people said, well, that's true. Said, we don't see how, why, why don't you don't play? Because they had, all these were baseball fans who had came to the game and see, you know, had seen us play out there. So that's as near as I could make it into organized baseball. Good. Tell me about some of the, you know, like you guys traveled in every possible way, I guess, in private cars, on buses, mm -hmm. Pullmans, every conceivable method of transportation. Yeah. You must have had some really interesting times with the travel aspect. Today oh. it's all airplanes and two-hour trips. Back then it may be 24-hour trips. Tell me some of the things that happened to you during those times. Well, <clears throat> for a lot of trips, uh, one of the funny trips I can tell you about, when I was with Detroit, we were on the way from Detroit, we were going to play in Nashville. And we stopped at some little place down south there, and it was real humid there. We were traveling by bus then, and Detroit didn't have a bus, so consequently they chartered a bus. And we stopped at some little place in the south there, and it was real, real hot. So the bus driver, he pulled over, and out in the street there, there was a big, the water was running where the uh, horses, a uh, big trough there, where the horses uh, drank water, you know. So one of the boys, Turkey, Norman Stearns, he got out, he said, man, it's hot. I'm gonna get me, cause to the side of it, they had a little spigot where the water come out. I'm gonna get, some water, so he went over there and he got stuck down, put his mouth under there, and started getting a drink of water. The guy said, hey, nigga, get out from there, that's for horses. <laughs> that, that was one, one of the things, and a lot of incidents that you ran into the South, but generally uh, there's very good people everywhere, but that was one of the funny incidents, and a lot of times we were, from Chicago, when I was in Chicago, we were on the way to St. Louis and we stopped at a restaurant and we went in to sit down and uh, they just kept passing up and down, the way waitress passed up and down, up and down, up and down. And so Jelly said, uh, don't you see us sitting there? He said, we, we want to eat. She said, I'm sorry. I can't serve you people. He said, why? Because the manager don't want, well tell the manager to come in. So the manager, he came on out, and he saw all of us fellows there. And uh, he said, well, it's been a policy. And, uh, but he said, wait just a minute. So he put a petition off for a seat. Well, I, we ran into quite a few of those places. But generally, I don't know, so many people have said that they were treated this way in that place, but we knew exactly what we could do, at least the managers that I played for. We knew exactly what we could do, so we weren't too much embarrassed because we didn't try to force ourselves on places that we knew that we weren't supposed to be there. A lot of them, and we 
the teams, I guess I was very fortunate because Rube Foster had mostly college players. And then after that, Dave Malasha, they had more college players. And these fellas, they knew what to expect and uh, they were a little more educated than quite a few of the other teams were. Consequently, we didn't run into that racial problem because we didn't force it. See, that's where most of the trouble came, when you force a thing. And when you going around outside, like traveling around out in uh, Iowa, all out through those places, they don't have uh, facilities for Negroes out there. But when we ever went any place, we always had it so that we knew exactly where we were going to stay or where we were going to eat. That's the way it was with uh, Rube Foster and, and Bingo the Moss. And I hear all the fellas talk about it. They couldn't eat this place. They had to eat out of uh, paperback sandwiches and all that kind of stuff. I, we did that once. The whole time I was with, played baseball. I never had any, any trouble, trouble like that on those team, organized team. But the other fellow said, uh, you can't eat this place. I said, well, we ate there. And they didn't believe it. It's because uh, Bingo de Moss, they had prearranged, you know, for a place for us to eat. And we had a one fellow on there who was real light. He, you could pass a white. So we went into one place at this certain time, and uh, she told us, that, said, uh, you, you can come on up front with the rest. Larry Brown, Larry Brown said, no, nah, I'll stay back here with the boys. And another time we were down in Memphis, and we were on the corner, the, the doctor, Martin, and his office was upstairs over this building, and we were standing, there was a pool hall downstairs, and we were standing down there talking. And all of a sudden we heard a boom, 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 a knock on the, and they all, everybody ran. So. Julius Green and I, we just stood there. After a while, here comes a big policeman waddling up to there. He said, didn't you hear me knock on? I said, we, yeah, we heard it, but what, what's it for? He said, where are you from? And we told him. And he said, well, the reason that he didn't allow the boys to congregate around there, he said, because uh, they were harassing the women that walked up and down the street and he was just trying to keep it peaceful for those people. He said, well, he said, there are causal people don't talk to us about Chicago and different places. So a lot of times, those kind of things, those racial things, the, our people bring it on themselves. See? And uh, you talk about, of course, I ran into white ball players who actually hated Negroes. They did that. And they did but you had to just tell them where you stood and where they stood. Because most all of it, when you ran into those racial problems, there was more for us than it was against us. So very few incidents. We had fights or something like that. Never, I don't never remember having a fight, you know, for the white ball player on a club that where we had a fight. Because around Chicago, we played mostly white semi-pro ball clubs around there all the time. Oh, by the way, uh, one of the better ball players I ever saw in my life was uh, Buck Weaver of the Black Sox. He played on a club uh, called Duffy Florals, and he was buddy-buddy with everybody. So there's, you know, real great fellas, and it's too bad that he got caught up in that uh, scandal. But he was one of the best third basemen I ever saw in my life. I saw Brooke Robinson and all these other fellas play. And great nettles, I've seen them all. Schmidt and the team in the um, California League. So he needed an outfielder, and I don't know why I let him persuade me into coming down there to play. But I played, went down there, and the salary limit was 250, and they gave me 250 and 250 under the table to play. So I <clears throat> played down there and <clears throat> then we went on a trip. The trip we was going was from uh, Tijuana to Las Vegas. And we had to stop. We stopped for a lunch break. And we was traveling by bus. 
and it took me around about five minutes to get out the bus. My knee had stiffened up on me. <laughs> so I told him, I said, okay. And so they brought me a sandwich on the inside. Then, when we got to Las Vegas, we played, played Las Vegas, and I told him, I said, uh, I can't make it anymore. I said, no, well, it's, it's too hard. You know, to play, play baseball and hurting don't make sense. So I played with him around about three months, and I called it a day. He yeah. called me a day. Basically, I didn't quit baseball. Baseball quit me. <laughs> <laughs> Good line. Yeah. Now, after that, you became a scout. Yeah. I uh, was out to the ballpark one day, and Bobby Maddox was out there, and he wanted, uh, he was asking Chet. At that time, Chet was working for the Pittsburgh Pirates, and so uh, he said, well, I'm looking for a scout. He said, well, here, Lou, Lou was one of our great ball players, and I talked to him, and Bob, Bobby at that time, Bobby was working for uh, Gabe Paul. And he was at Cincinnati. So I signed on with him. And I worked with Bobby for quite a number of years. And then as a, Gabe, as he moved on, why well, I followed him around. We had to get a, uh, a, a, we had a contract, then he moved to Houston the next year. So we stayed in Houston next year because Gabe, Gabe went to, a, a, went back to Cleveland. So I stayed with Cleveland oh, quite some time. And, and while it, you were scouting, you uh, traveled how much? Oh, my territory was from uh, Los Angeles, clean up through Fresno. And over on the west coast, I went as far as uh, Vandenberg uh, Air Base over there, and then back to Colton. I did all, all the Southern California, wherever I found out that it was a good ball player because at that time there was no draft and being no draft every time you heard of a good ball player somebody tell you about a ball player you followed it around and so in that way I got Dave Nelson uh, and Dave Nelson we signed Dave Nelson and also uh, we signed uh, Bob Boyd both of them pitched in the pitching uh, played on Cleveland and we had a farm club in the Sea League up in Salinas. And that's where uh, Phil Cabaretta was managing. And also, I was batting instructor up there because Phil uh, asked me, uh, said you was a good hitter. He says, uh, show these kids uh, some uh, technique and show them how to bunt and drag the ball. And Lou Pinelli was up there at the time, and who now is the manager of the, uh, of the Yankees. He was up there on that ball club. And then I had, in fact, I had four, four fellows from Los Angeles up there. Uh, another Bradshaw, a pitcher, and the, another outfielder who later on now, Paul Jefferson, who later on now is a policeman down in L.A. Only two of the fellows went to the big league zone. And Good. Lou, yeah. did you ever stop to think about your life if it hadn't been for baseball? How would it have been different? Very difficult. When I think now, baseball did a whole lot for me. Just look at now. I'm doing now something that I never thought. Never thought. Uh, when I first met uh, Dave, uh, Dave asked me uh, to kind of uh, help along. He said, I'll make you famous. He said, more than you are. Not that you're not famous now. But I said, OK. So now I'm more famous than I ever was. I know more people now, and I've met more people through uh, decathlon than I ever thought of. And I get to meet, see quite a few people that I played against. I played against a fella that played with Bushwick, and he came out to me in uh, Anaheim one day, and he said, uh, you don't know me, but I know you by your name here. He said that, and he called his name and told me, he said, well, I played with Bushwick. And I said, what's your name? And he was a center fielder that played with Bushwick. See if I hadn't have been connected with these the Catholic uh, baseball cards I never would have known. Let's talk about baseball in general. You know, what you, you were Baseball a, in general? Yeah, just what, how, how baseball and playing baseball changed your life? Baseball changed my life. I've often wondered what I would have been doing now if it hadn't have been for baseball. 
I probably would have been retired, sure. But uh, baseball gave me everything, everything now that, that I don't regret a day that I spent playing baseball, the time that I consumed. In fact, I'm kind of glad they didn't give me a job doing something else because I would have been old and out of the way, probably creeped over. Now I can get around. I have a bad knee, but that's all right. I got that from baseball. But to actually regret playing baseball, I don't. Because from baseball, I've met friends, I see the old ones, and I do things now that I probably never would have did. Then the travel, look at the travel that I went through. Now well, I've, I, I've, I've seen you at uh, baseball card shows and kids 10, 12 years old come up and, and know who Lou Dials is and want your autograph and yeah, want, they, want to hear stories. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel wonderful because had I not been doing it or doing something else, that's old man dial. <laughs> that's what all it would be. Now I'm somebody. I'm more now than I was. As I've often said, one guy said, uh, uh, Jerry Williams, he said, Lou, you're somebody now. Here's a guy who wants to do a statue of you. Yeah, they, they, uh, there's a statue that the sculptors are making of myself, hitting on both sides, and it'll be out pretty soon. I've seen the draft of it. It's pretty good. And those kind of things. And my picture always in the news and always in the different newspapers that they have, I feel real good. And have you have a name on the marquee at the big place like Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas? I would have never had that if I would have been doing something else. No, this is wonderful. I love it. I love every minute of it. I hope it just, it just don't end too soon. By the way, I'll be, uh, I even get invited to headline shows. I headline the Bob Lee up in uh, San Francisco. I was up there and I'll be back in St. Louis. I travel all over. I, this is the second time, the third time that I've had a chance to come east this year. Had I been doing some other job, it never would have happened. So I'm grateful for everything that I received out of baseball. About the emotional. I uh, the emotional thing that you see, the most emotional thing that I ever came across when I found out I couldn't play anymore. <laughs> when my legs were bad on me and I couldn't play anymore after coming back. But you know, uh, one thing, baseball, you can stay around it too long. And that's, uh, I find some of the ball players, but I quit playing in 46, I could have played a couple more years. In 1946 at that age, I was 42. I could have played a couple more years because I had a chance to go back east and play with the uh, Crawfords. But uh, I didn't want to play because I was then working. I went back to the uh, Crawford Grill. And he was the one who, uh, I remember when they first, first started up. Uh, all the time came to Chicago looking for ball players, and uh, and the uh, New York Black Yankees. Uh, probably came there by uh, Bojangles had the club, Robinson the dancer, and the guys came around recruiting ball players. But I was with DeMoss, and I wasn't about to leave him to go out there and play on you know some of those teams that uh, you know you didn't know what was going to happen. I knew playing with DeMoss, I knew all the time what uh, he would do as an owner and how he'd take care of you. So I just never did think too much about going anywhere other than him. I could have gone a lot of times with other ball clubs, but I, most of my time I stayed around with the, with the DeMoss, Bingo DeMoss. Because they used to say, that's, uh, that's old DeMoss's boy. <laughs> <laughs> you were right there with me. Yeah, I was right there all the time. Lou, Bingo DeMoss was supposed to have been the uh, prototype for Bingo Long and his traveling all-stars the movie. Now, is that correct? No. No? No, it had nothing bearing to it. No connection? No connection whatsoever. And, and quite a few, The uh, I remember when they had us out to the Universal Studio 
is around about, oh, maybe 15 ball players in the Negro League who was out in California at that time. And we went there and we got up and left from before it was half over with. Uh, Mrs. Manley was there, only of the, uh, of the Newark Eagles. And it was so disgusting, uh, we just got up and left. It wasn't nothing like Negro baseball. It was just something to make money, a vehicle to make money off of. But as far as uh, Negro baseball, it had no bearing on the way that the Negro baseball players lived. Just, you know, and so we thought it was awful, to tell you the truth. I did. Because it uh, low rated what we were. The, the people that you talk to today at shows that ask you really the, the heavy questions, or when you talk to a reporter, do you find that they have a, a pretty good conception of how things were? Are they, are they way off, or, and, and how are they wrong, if they are? Uh, most of the baseball uh, reporters nowadays, they, after they have heard so much, they come up and ask you about those things because they know a lot of them have heard pro and con about it. See, just like I hear different ball players state uh, different things about how they came up. I heard Jerry and Gillum talking about he was paying for $150 a month when he came in league. And uh, quite a few of them, when they came in in the 30s, they came in under adverse conditions and they, they weren't making too much money. But in 1930, when I went to Hilldale, they wasn't, uh, them guys, they weren't making, and I got $200 a month then. That was in 1930s too, when things were real rough. And Judy and them, he cut us down to a dollar and a half a day because that was out, that was out in the East. But they never had been making any, any amount of money like the West did. But I, I couldn't hardly say that I had a bad day and a bad choice by playing baseball. It was real, it has been real great to me. And I wouldn't at no time have wanted to have changed. Not a bit. See, but the one time when we uh, was traveling, why, I remember uh, saying, the guy came up late in Chicago in 1936. He came up late uh, with the payday, and we were supposed to make a trip that afternoon going up to Madison, Wisconsin. That's the only time I had trouble with my salary. And uh, I told uh, Archie, I said, Archie, don't put my stuff on the bus. I'm not going. He said, why? I said, they're not paying. So <laughs> I said, guy said, oh, come on. He'll give me money. I said, no, you're going to pay me now. I'm not going. So Bingo the mouse said, uh, well, you're right. So the rest of the guys stood around there. So old man Little, he called me inside. He says, uh, Lou, he said, I don't have all your money. I said, well, you're not making any, uh, you're not making any kind of statements or anything about our pay for last, for the last 15 days. Lou, we're looking for some summary statement to, to cover. Just a waste tape. There's a one thing that uh, when we played the would play against major league ball players. I remember Al Olson who pitched for Cleveland, and at that time we were playing down in San Diego, and they had uh, Bob Elliott. Bob Elliott was the most valuable player in the National League, and when I came to town, they had my name over there to draw the people out. And I hit a home run off of uh, Al Olson, and the ball hit up in the stand and bounced back out. And he said, one guy said, where did he get all that? Jesus, where did he get all that power from? <laughs> and those times, then I thought about, I said, well, dog on it, I, I wonder how come uh, I couldn't get into big leagues. How come I never had a chance to uh, play? And when my friends would tell me, white ball players I used to go around with, they said, uh, Lewis, too bad, he said, that you couldn't have played, uh, got in the leagues. I said, yeah, I would have liked to, because I would have had a lot of fun. I would like to have seen what I could have did under playing condition, your playing condition. They said, it's just like now. He said, you'd have raised hell with the guys. So that, I don't feel too bad. I, 
for not being able to have been in. And then again, I do, because I knew the time was not right. And as, you know, things have come to pass, I only thing that I regret that I wasn't the first one in there. That's one thing I regret. Otherwise, I have no regret about not being in the big league. I got, I got the sentence I want you to go with, but I'm going to let you word it. Somehow, I don't want to be a star performer. Uh, there's, there's one thing that uh, I always think about. Every time I take an occasion, I'll go to the ballpark and I'll see the fellas uh, that they have playing now. And I knew at that time when I was playing that I was far superior to some of these superstars that they have playing now. And of all the great white ball players that I played against and how I dominated their pitching and how the other fellows tell me, Cool Papa Bell has told me time and time again, he says, uh, Lou, he says, uh, there's no reason he's why he said uh, you shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. He said, because there's nothing about playing baseball and I feel it could do that you couldn't do as good as anybody. He said, and I hope someday, he said, that you'll get in there. And that's my hope. Uh, Jerry Williams has a uh, petition out now, and they're going to write all the, uh, all the fellows that's on the baseball committee. And there's quite a few of them on there, like Ted Williams and uh, Charlie Geringer and Stan Musel. Those fellows know what kind of ball players that I was because I played against them in one game. We played against Stan Musel and uh, I had more hits than he did. But he was hitting against Satchel that night. <laughs> and we played him at Wrigley uh, Field out in Los Angeles and they had left to grow pitching. And I got a couple hits that night. So I knew that I could play. I knew that I could play and hit those good pitchers. So, is getting into the Hall of Fame, that's the next thing. If I don't get into it, if I, uh, then there's something wrong. At least that's the way everyone, everyone tells me. And the petitions out where most all the ball players that I've seen, uh, Gomez and Frank, and all the fellas, have signed this petition. So hopefully, I'll get in it. That's my next hope. Overall, Before I though, die. <laughs> overall, though, would you say that baseball's been a pretty good life for you? It's, baseball has been my whole life. And in the last couple of years, since 1984, since I started on this tour for Decathlon, I found out how much baseball really meant to me. Prior to that time, I would just, you know, just shove it off. But now it means more to me than ever because I get to talk to people and then I see that the fellow's going now. And I talk to Yastramski all on the, 6th of uh, September, 6th and 7th of September. And we got to talking and come to find out I had played against his father. And he talked to his father and his father asked me to uh, send him one of my pictures. So all those things are real great. And I love every minute of it. <laughs> I think we have it. I think we have it. Great. You see it rolling over here? Yeah. Oh, we got it What's about the kind of bat you used to use? Huh? What about the kind of bat you used to use? What kind? Yeah. I use a Leo de Roche model. And it's 36 inches long 
and the weight, 36 ounces. And I felt real comfortable swinging a bat. And at that time, I was weighing 185 pounds with no pouch like this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing on this. <laughs> you ready for this one? I don't have my glass. I'm not going to catch it. No, no, okay. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. I'll give you the easy one. <laughs> nah, that's too, too, too awkward. Too awkward? We won't do that. I mean, yeah. Go there. Want to hire? No, no. Just throw it like that. You see? That's that kind of glove is a stiff. Yeah. Good move. No. <laughs> <laughs> see, if one of them other gloves, see, I could have caught it like that because oh, I've yeah. been used yeah. to all this crap up here. I never would catch it before. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right. Yeah. Come on, Luke. No glasses, even. Yeah. Very smooth, Lou. Tell me about your uh, going to college. Oh, the first, uh, I went up to uh, State Teachers College up in Santa Barbara, which was a branch of the University of California as of today. And I stayed up there and played football up there on the uh, team, which was called the Foothills at the time. Played halfback on the team, and uh, we played various schools around in, in our class. It wasn't a uh, finished college. And then I came down, in the wintertime, I came down to play baseball, and that's that's how I lost my scholarship before I went up to Cal. And I was ineligible to play at the University of California up north in Berkeley. But nevertheless, I went up, and then I come down. And then at the end of the 25 season, why, that's when I went up to uh, Kansas City and Rogan and them of the Kansas City Monarchs at least had recommended me and uh, Rube Foster had sent for me. My mother called me and told me about it and uh, I went to Chicago. But I came back later on during the winter season and I finished, I finally finished uh, in 1927. Because in 26 I married and I went to school all of 26 and ended up 27. I finally finished and had my degree. I'm going to cut that and go in tighter because that noise was there. Okay, pick it up again right where you left off. Oh, <clears throat> then after I received my degree, I, I tried uh, unsuccessfully to get employment, so I had baseball to fall back on. So I continued to play baseball. And I played uh, baseball, and I was very fortunate that I could do something else. And it was fascinating to me at the time, so I just forgot about pursuing any uh, employment other than baseball. And it was a year-round job playing in the East, in the league in the East, and then coming out in the wintertime or go wherever, wherever you wish. I mostly preferred to come back uh, on the coast and play. Let's cover uh, some more. We talked yesterday about the uh, fact you played baseball year round. Let's get that story done again. Okay. Typical season, typical year round deal. Let's start, start be playing what, in January in, uh, okay, in LA typical, or what? Uh, typical, for instance, I'll go back to the season of. 1927, beginning of 1927, <clears throat> we were playing down with the Los Angeles White Sox. The Los Angeles White Sox, the manager of the team, he had a contract to go to uh, 
Japan, Honolulu, and the Philippines. And he was paying the fellows $800. But they found out the myself and a couple of other fellows, they didn't want to give but half share, but 400 Then part of the group that were going east to play, George Harney and Bill Foster, uh, Chicago American Giants, said, what are you going there for? I said, come on, said, uh, we're going up north. And we we're going rogue, and he was with that bunch. Okay. I'd like you to do is just give me a, a, a summary. Instead of going into the, the money, the the, um, the the timetable, like you started in January, playing okay. wherever, and just I want to skip all over the country to show you were playing baseball for the whole year. Okay. Okay. We played uh, in Portland. We played the Portland Ball Club at, uh, in Bakersfield. Then we played the, uh, this is a Pacific Coast League teams who were in training at that time, and played Seattle, we played up at San Jose. Then we drove across country, going back to Chicago, and when we was in Chicago, that was spring training. Then we started, then our season started uh, in May, May the 15th, we started, and we would play throughout September the 15th. September the 15th, and we played exhibition games against various uh, major league white clubs and the semi-pro clubs that was around Chicago, and then we would play the major league combined clubs of Earl Max All-Stars. That was uh, Corny Mack's son, and they had very good players. Then after that was over, then it was time to come back to California for the Winter League. They come back to California, so we playing continuously the year round. And he also went to Mexico, the Caribbean. Yeah, Where Mexico, else? and there was the Caribbeans and South America. There was plenty of places available to play baseball. All the Negroes played baseball the year round because the four months period that you had, you could not sustain yourself just playing four months. Great. That's what I wanted to hear. What's your opinion of Happy Chandler? Happy Chandler was. Uh, probably did more at that time for Negro baseball than any other because I don't think uh, Kenshaw or anyone else who was ahead of him was very interested uh, because they are more or less were controlled by the owners. Chandler had, Chandler more or less was a person of his own conviction I, and I'm quite sure that is the reason why that uh, he okayed it for Negroes to be into baseball, because I'm quite sure that they could have been in prior to that time had it been someone like he that was in office. Get some more about the East-West All-Star game. Uh, the East-West All-Star, that game was, uh, I'm quite sure and almost positive that uh, Abe Saperstein was the one who originated the idea of the game, and he went to uh, various owners in the Negro League and brought this idea to him. I'm, I know positive that uh, he was the one that secured the park for the All-Star game. And at that time, he was booking for the Negro League Western part of it at uh, 5%. On several occasions, I rode with him where, <coughs> to places where we were to play games and we talked in length about various aspects of the Negro League. In fact, uh, he did quite a bit for the Negro League. He owned part of a Birmingham Black Barons at one time. And that All-Star game, when it, uh, the, after, I think it was less than 8,000 people who were at our All-Star game in 1933 than was at the uh, East, uh, East-West game, that was our All-Star game, and the uh, American League and National League had had theirs earlier. And we played, in fact, we played two. We played, after we left Chicago, we went over to Cleveland. We played another All-Star game over there the next Sunday at their new stadium, and they had oh, probably 45 to 55,000 people over there in their new stadium. Now, so, Lou, the, the big numbers of people that were the all-star games and your, you know, when, when the Homestead Grays by the Croppers, let's say in Washington, D.C., drew big crowds. When, oh, yes. When the American <coughs> Giants played somebody in Chicago, a big team coming through, 
big crowds. What was the, 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 the makeup of the crowd? Black people, white people, lots of both, or what? They were mixed. They were, the, the crowd was integrated. There was more people there. It, it, they had to be of those of, say, uh, in Washington, D.C., you had practically more whites than you did Negroes that came because that was something that they wanted to see. And in fact, I would say that the, when we would play in the Yankee Stadium and places like that in those big stadiums, you would have nearly as many whites as you, if you did uh, did uh, Negroes. More, more, sometimes there's more whites than there were Negroes at, in the park, Good. especially in New York. When this car passes, it can start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing I'd like to say <clears throat> in respect to the ball players who helped me in my career, generally uh, there's Mothel and Rogan, Mackey, and Jelly Gardner. Those are ball players that I played with, and they taught me quite a bit. They would, I was asking, I would see how they would do different things especially in running bases. Mothel and I used to see Mothel and Jelly Guard and them, how they could slide and how they could get off of first base and get back. And so they said, well, if you want to learn, we'll teach you. Because a great ball player had played beside their uh, Jelly Gardner, Dick Harris, who later on became manager of uh, the Homestead Graves. They couldn't get along. And so that's the reason I had a chance to play in Chicago. And when I came to Chicago, Jelly Gardner, he and I became great friends. And I would say, well, Jelly, balls hit this way and that way. And he would take, he'd say, well, come on out. And I'd go out with him early in the morning, and he'd fungo balls to me and tell me how to round the ball up and how to run out from under a fly ball and get back around so you'd be in a position to throw. And Mackey, he would laugh. He said, well, all gone, kid. He says, uh, you can hit what you want me to tell you about. And I just said, well, I just want you to tell me different things about what to do. If you're a catcher. I said, so you tell me how you can tell when a man's fixing to run. And he would give me, he said, you watch the pitcher. He said, because every pitcher, he says, there's a trait that if you watch and you get off a of base, he said, you get off a of first base and you watch and you can tell exactly when a guy's fixing her to leave a ball. And at that, those fellows helped me. Then the managers, Bingo de Moss and Rube, they were masters at uh, giving signals and directing a game. I see them, they would do things that uh, was constructive in younger ball players, especially if you had some ability. If you didn't have any ability, they didn't bother around with you. But I guess I was quite lucky <clears throat> because I came up with good ball players. Even though I'd seen them all the time and I always wanted to pattern myself after those fellas. And that's what I did. And um, years later, I remember uh, we was playing against <laughs> in the All-Star game to be in fact, and Mackie says, or, uh, well, you're not going to get nothing low. <laughs> he said so. Don't think you're going to jack the ball out to ballpark today. So I was hitting against Satchel, and he kept him up around where he knew I couldn't hit the ball out to ballpark. And then when I grounded out one time, that evening he was laughing. He said, well, you didn't get on nothing today, did you? I said, no, not hardly. He said, that's all right. He said, it happens to all of us. We're done that way. Yeah. Rogan... Uh, when Casey Singer became manager of the uh, New York Yankees, he had adopted, he had seen Rogan. At that time, they had acquired two pitchers. One was uh, Turley and Larson from Baltimore, and they were very wild. And then he remembered that Rogan had perfect control, but he never wound up. And he taught Larson and Turley, and they, as you know their history, they became uh, great pitchers, great control pitchers. Another thing, Rogan, uh, now that you have different pitchers in the Negro League, they were using those things, oh, Jesus, way 
in the 1920s because they had curved balls in. Now what they call the slider, they were throwing that thing way back in the 1920s. That's what they call their nickel curve ball because it didn't break good. But they could throw it, which they don't have now. The only pitcher that I've seen throw like that was Sutton and Kofax. It had a straight overhand drop ball, and now they call it overhand curve. But Kofax and uh, uh, Sutton, their ball goes right straight down, and that's what you call a drop ball. Well, now, Rogan and them threw the ball, but it broke in instead of out from it. It broke straight down and in on our batter. So it was very difficult for fellas to hit. And the palm ball, that's another thing that uh, was in the American League that uh, Rogan talked about. And the screwball, all those things came, of course, years ago, they called it the fadeaway. It was pitched in the original baseball. But the screwball, every pitcher on the Monarchs could throw a screwball. So those were nothing, uh, they were something new when they came into the uh, in organized baseball. And the split fingered fastball, that was nothing but the guys called uh, just a changeup. They was calling that their changeup because they were throwing so hard. They had one pitcher that threw so hard that he could stand at pitcher's box and they had a plank, an inch plank, at home plate and he would bust that ball, bust the plank. Now they talk about the, uh, talk about this machine that they have, gun now that they have for uh, measuring the speed of a ball. <laughs> and so umpires, I remember they were talking about Dave Herman said, that one day they were talking about, Dave Herman said, doggone Rogan would have busted one of those things. <laughs> and comparing Rogan and Satchel, Dave Herman, and all the rest of the fellows who had, especially Dave Herman, because we would talk together, and Irish Musil, we talked quite, quite a bit. They said that there was no comparison between Rogan and Satchel's pitching. We had great, great pitching, and it's too bad that, uh, they couldn't have played organized baseball.